So this project got out of hand very quickly. You know, if you're someone like me, you just find yourself on these pages, right? I was scrolling through the mathematical alphanumeric symbols page, looking up random Unicode character stuff. And I came across this chart and this chart, man, this chart appealed to me. I immediately had a really dumb idea to turn my keyboard into a toggle mode where it could type these normal characters and then it could go and type these cursive characters too. And I thought this won't be that hard, right? It's just Unicode. But no, it was very hard. And I'm really excited to say I have the script working. I'm going to show you how it works. And I'm probably never going to use this again. Even if you're not familiar with Unicode itself, you see its work every day. Unicode is the group responsible for maintaining the list of the world's characters so that everyone agrees on how to send and receive text. Now, normally, this is something in the background. You never really have to worry about how text encoding works. But in the case of the characters not found on your keyboard, like these emoji Japanese characters or today cursive letters, auto hockey generally doesn't like working with them. And we're going to have to kind of do some extra steps to be able to print those characters using the send command. Our journey starts with UTF-16. I was expecting to have to use UTF-8. UTF-8 is the most common text encoding format in the world. But this sentence right here, it's used primarily by Windows. And of course, AutoHockey being a Windows language means that we had to use UTF-16. So this definitely confused me for a while. But once I figured that out, I was able to keep going. If we go back to our chart from the beginning that we're going to be referencing, these characters start at 1D49C. Back at the UTF-16 page, you'll see 1D49C does not actually fit in this first section. Because UTF-16 is stored with 16-bit values, it gets a little more complicated when the Unicode value is above FFFF. And since what we're going to be working with today is, we're going to have to move on to this special section. I'm not going to go over what happens when you have a character with a value above the 16-bit limit, but basically the idea is that you have one value called a high surrogate and another value called a low surrogate. Those two will form two separate Unicode characters, and they combine together. And when the Unicode text is rendered, it realizes that those two characters combined actually mean this other character. If you scroll down a little more, there is an example that kind of like walks you through what the algorithm is to determine these two characters, the high surrogate and the low surrogate. If that doesn't make sense, all you need to know is that two characters combined make one character. And we need to get those two characters to be able to print that new character. So now that we've looked at UTF-16, we can understand what the Stack Overflow page is about. This question saved this project. I had been completely lost and trying to do exactly what this guy asked, right? He was looking at just sending the U plus and the value of the character he wants to send. This seems pretty reasonable because it does work with four digit codes. And as I explained before, the way Unicode actually works is that it's two separate code point characters. So if we look at the answers here, I tried to do this, but this ended up being a little complicated because he's using that algorithm to come up with these values to just print this one thing. I didn't want to have to calculate that for every single character because I ended up with over 100 characters I wanted to use. Thankfully, somebody else had done that. JMI Madison, three years ago, wrote this amazing function called Funksend Unicode, and it does exactly the algorithm I showed you before to split out the different code points and being able to print them. Of course, this will be in the description as well if you wanted to see what his function was. I did make some changes to the function to get it to work better for my purposes, but if you want the original and all of his comments, they are there. So let's hop into my script now. I took his funks and Unicode function, and like I said, I changed a couple of things about it. The first thing I did was I wanted it to work with characters that had five digits and characters that were below five digits. The way I pulled that off was just a simple check and a early return. You can't use that U plus syntax. Uh, I tried this at first, and I was getting weird uh, Japanese characters showing up and Chinese characters. It was really confusing. But the CHR function works which goes ahead and returns the Unicode character code correctly. It is a little above my pre grade. I'm not really sure what this is doing that's different than the other way, but you know what? This works. Didn't want to look at it anymore. 
So next, this is all the same code that was in the post. It's just the algorithm from the Wikipedia page. Uh, I didn't really want to redo it. It's fine. It works. But I did get rid of his whole clipboard hack thing. Uh, he says, Sendster works fine in Google Chrome, but fails in Notepad++. I don't know. I don't use Notepad++. And I called him on it. I said, what if I just send stir, send the final output, and you know what? It just works for me. If it doesn't work for you, I left his code in. Maybe you can try that clipboard hack, but it's kind of crappy. So next, we're going to look at my giant table of characters. Uh, I actually used unicodesearch.net, and it had all of the script characters, and I was able to copy them over pretty easily from this. So we're printing cursive small characters, cursive capital characters, bold cursive capital characters, and bold cursive small characters. And this is just the list of 1 is A, 2 is B, 3 is C, all the way down. You will notice, though, that not all of these characters match the same pattern. So we're looking at the cursive small character set. There is a five digit for A, five digit for B, C, D, and then E looks really weird. If we go back to our chart from the beginning to the uh, small letter section, you'll see this E actually is a pink background. And basically, these characters were actually introduced first as mathematical symbols. And then only later did Unicode bring all of the script characters in. And it's just like a weird thing. It just happened this way. If you tried to continue the pattern and just say 1D4BA, this character doesn't exist at all. With the combination of the send Unicode function and the cursive character table, we can do whatever we want now. Remember, what I wanted to do was being able to switch between the cursive mode and the regular mode. I made this switch mode function, and all it does is set a global variable called mode. And it's either going to be alphabet, bold cursive for the bold set of Unicode cursive characters, or the light cursive for the light Unicode cursive characters. Next, for our actual hotkeys, I basically have one hotkey for every single letter, which calls the small function to send a small letter. Or if you press Shift A, Shift B, it calls the capital version. Another thing that I did was have a hotkey if to determine whether or not any of these hotkeys need to trigger at all. So if you're typing normally with alphabet, then no hotkeys need to be triggered because nothing special needs to happen. The last part is just printing the characters. Our hotkey calls out to the small or the caps function. And then depending on what the mode is, it's going to use the bold list or the regular uh, light cursive list. And whether it's caps or small, it calls the capital version or the small version. The last thing I want to point out is I was able to put all of the cursive characters at the bottom of the file. And that's kind of more of an aesthetic reason. I could have just had them at the top. But I thought it would have been nice to not have to see all of that and scroll past 100 lines at the beginning. So instead, these are global variables. And when I call this set cursive character function, it gets assigned to the global variable. That's what this global flag does. Same with the small and caps functions. Uh, here I'm directly saying mode, bold cursive capital, and cursive capital are global variables. But you could also just do global and it would make every variable a global variable in this function. So now I'll do a little demo. Of course, I can type normally with alphabet. Here is alphabet. Now I can switch to bold cursive with F6 and use the bold font. Here is bold. And I can switch to F7 to do the light cursive. Here is light. You can use this anywhere, though. I was surprised to see that you can actually type in cursive in Google, and it pretty much works. Shout out to Google for actually supporting this. This is crazy. Most things won't work, though. So I've noticed if you do keyboard shortcuts like Control-C, Control-V when you're in cursive mode, that does not work. Um, I mean, not that anyone would do this. This is insane from start to finish. But uh, you know what? I had a lot of fun doing this, and I hope you had fun watching. If you like this video and you want to see more automation scripts and tutorials, check out my other videos. See ya!